start. So uh, I have to say that uh, Sven has already got in touch with the Rux community uh, by accepting to talk in my lab this morning. And it's been just fantastic, uh, very inspiring and a lot of work for you today. <laughs> a lot of uh, questions and things, but I want to tell you something about uh, Sven's uh, path. Uh, he's a professor of psychology at the University of York in the UK, which he joined in 2012. Uh, for me, he's an example of a European researcher being trained both in Europe and in the US, and then he integrated academia in, in Europe, like, like I did, and then I came back to the US. Uh, but after graduating from the Université Libre de Bruxelles, he moved to the USA to carry out his PhD at the State University of New York at Stony Brook. He then conducted postdoctoral work at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and then at the House Here, uh, Here Institute in Los Angeles. And then he moved back to Europe. He went to uh, Bristol first, University of Bristol, uh, UK, where he, like, where he was uh, from 2001 to 2012 as professor in experimental psychology. Uh, and then he moved to York, where he is uh, now. Okay, so his research has touched a lot of areas of the psychology of language and acquisition. Uh, he's been particularly concerned with the way we learn and understand speech and how we identify uh, linguistic units, uh, not only segments, but word boundaries, for instance, uh, by using uh, um, uh, different acoustic cues, duration has been one of the things that he's been looking at a lot. I have to say that uh, very early on at Johns Hopkins, he worked with Peter Jusik um, on infants' word segmentation abilities already, showing that infants do not respond to simple recurring phonemic patterns, but they are sensitive to both acoustic and allophonic cues to word boundaries. So that's something that, you know, Sven has been working on for a while. And his current research focuses on the perceptual and cognitive mechanisms involving uh, recognizing speech, uh, and of course, now with a special interest in the everyday circumstances under which speech is experienced, such as noise, divided attention, and also lifespan changes, such as a the aging uh, cognitive system. Uh, so I'm going to finish this by saying that I, uh, I, have, I have the pleasure of uh, having known Sven for a long time. We worked together in a European research and training network. Uh, called Sound to Sense. Uh, we were, you know, we were trying. We were training PhD and postdoctoral students uh, across Europe. And now I see that Sven is a member of the Marie Curie Training Network. Inspire, uh, sorry, investigating speech processing in realistic environments, and is also prin principal investigator on an ESRC project entitled Word Learning in Early, Middle, and Late Adulthood. So uh, welcome again to Sven. Um, thanks for having accepted this invitation. So please uh, go ahead, share your, I think you want to share. Yes, your thank slide. you, Mara Paola. Um, thanks to you. I think it's Jason who's... who's um, uh, I, I think I have the permission. It seems like something's yeah. happening when I click on the button. So um, I'm going to do something a bit strange. Um, I think you're going to see yourself for a second. Um, just to check, can you see a white screen with a little loudspeaker in the middle? Yes. Okay, I'm going to click on the loudspeaker. It should say test. If you don't hear test, then I'm in trouble. You don't hear, did, did you share your sound when you shared your slides? There's also a little thing on Zoom where you have to say share sound. Yes, I did. I'm going to play it again. It was a bit delayed. Hold on. Test. Yes. Okay. That's good now. Yeah. Oh, good. All right. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's really wonderful to be in New Jersey. Um, I On my way to Johns Hopkins, I lived in Philadelphia. I you know, I, I was on that side of the uh, Eastern Corridor for several years, so I know the, the area well, uh, but not Rutgers. I have never been to the Rutgers campus. And uh, well, I'm not going to be there today either, but I guess I'll be in the Rutgers community, which is um, fantastic. So thank you very much. Test. Oh, sorry. Great. Um, so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the effect of cognitive load on speech perception. Um, 
And I'm going to start with a general introduction. I go through it quite quickly um, because it's, it's really background information, but it's useful. Um, in speech science, most of what we know comes from um, spoken stimuli recorded and experience under speech lab conditions. Um, so stimuli are usually carefully produced uh, in quiet conditions. If there is any noise, the noise is edited out. And the speech task very often is a single, simple goal-directed task, and it's taking place in a non-distracting and quiet environment. So that's what I call a sound booth speech research. And it's been really instrumental in building models of speech perception, spoken word recognition, sentence comprehension. What we know less about is how we perceive speech in everyday listening conditions. So natural or sometimes adverse listening conditions. Now, a few years ago, um, a small group of us got together and we decided to create a sort of typology of adverse conditions. Now, anyone could put together a typology of adverse conditions and they would probably um, look a bit different from ours. What we tried to do is create a typology of adverse conditions that um, map onto specific mechanisms and that have theoretical interest or theoretical relevance in different areas. So we came up with four categories of uh, adverse conditions. And in this talk, I will talk about the last one of those four. So um, challenges can arise from a, degrad a degradation of the signal at the source. So the uh, speech signal um, departs from expectations. It's non-canonical, whether it's because it's accented, has disfluencies in it. Um, so, but the degradation is at the source of the signal itself. Now, the challenge can arise not from a source degradation, but from a, a degradation during transmission in the environment. So that's speech in noise, a competing talker, or filtered speech over the telephone, for example. Now, following this transmission line, um, challenges can arise not in the source or during transmission, but at the receiver end of the equation. So here, peripherally, for example, sensory neural deficits, so um, hearing impairments, or non-native listening, in which the um, uh, 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 in which the uh, the model, the language model, is either incorrect or incomplete. Then finally, and that's really the, the adverse condition I'm interested in in this talk, cognitive load, broadly construed. So uh, I'm interested in those listening conditions leading to a depletion of processing resources uh, due to short-term memory overload or divided attention. That's what I'm interested in. That's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, cognitive load itself can be broken down into uh, subcomponents. I'll go over them very briefly, just so that we understand what I mean by cognitive load. Um, cognitive load can be signal intrinsic. So those would be demands arising from the linguistic complexity of the signal, the speech signal itself. For instance, its syntactic structure. Classic example with a subject subject relative sentence or an object relative sentence, the dog that bit the child, as opposed to the child that the dog bit. The second one is syntactically more complex. So it's been shown many times, the uh, cognitive demands will be elevated, working memory will be taxed to a greater extent in the second sentence, because some materials will have to be held uh, in working memory for a little while, such as the child, the dog, until the thematic themes of these phrases can be unraveled. Okay. So, but that will create cognitive demands arising from the signal itself. Now, cognitive load arising from other adverse conditions, and that's the case of uh, the cognitive consequences of speech and noise, for instance. So if you have a spectrogram of a target sentence here, the same target against a uh, competing talker. The, the goal will be to segregate the target speaker, uh, selectively attend to it, and inhibit the uh, competing talker, uh, performing something that 
is sometimes called a glimpse extraction. So you're trying to extract glimpses of the target through the masker, and that will be costly in terms of memory and attentional resources. And then finally, this is really the one I'm going to talk about. So cognitive load arising from completely external demands, external to the speech task or the speech stimuli. For example, a, um, a concurrent task. So here we're really talking about situations in which we divide our attention between a speech task and a non-speech task. Um, classic example, well, it's not classic for everyone, but you'll recognize the, the example. Um, so the effect of um, monitoring the environment, the horizon and dials in the cockpit of a plane on your ability to perceive and understand messages um, uh, from ground control. Okay, so that is the kind of question I'm interested in, the effect of um, external cognitive load on speech perception. Now, that's an area that has been debated quite a lot in the literature, and effects, detrimental effects of cognitive load have been shown um, over the entire architecture of the language system. So from top to bottom, um, cognitive load disrupts convergence during conversation, so the, uh, the laws of, uh, of dialogue are uh, affected. Lexical activation is also affected. So the extent to which we activate the word bone when we hear trombone, uh, that balance will be uh, upset. Uh, the cues we use for word segmentation to identify word boundaries in connected speech. Uh, segregation between speech and noise, as I showed you before. Um, and then this is what I'm gonna talk about a bit more today the effect of cognitive load on phoneme perception, the ability to identify phonemes, something as simple as that, and discriminate between phonemes under cognitive load. Um, then also further down, near threshold sound detection. So the effect of visual distraction on our ability to uh, even detect a sound, whether it's speech or not, near threshold. And then also a special case for speech, uh, the, the effect of cognitive load on the estimation of sound duration. Okay, so I'm going to focus on these three levels in this presentation. So let's start with phoneme perception. Um, now, what is the effect of phoneme category of, cognit of cognitive load? on phoneme categoriz categorization and discrimination. So what is the effect more specifically of cognitive load on the balance between bottom-up and top-down processes during speech perception? So however you, you look at the literature on phoneme perception and word recognition, you end up with two camps. We will not debate the, the difference today, but just for documentary reasons. Um, one camp in which uh, the flow of information from the signal to, uh, to lexical representation is uh, exclusively bottom-up, uh, and one in which the flow is bottom-up and top-down. Um, but the question I have, regardless of the two competing architectures here, is what is the effect of cognitive load? And I'll show you a simple divided attention task while performing speech perception tasks. What is the effect of cognitive load on the architecture? Is the locus lexical? So is cognitive load going to affect um, lexical activation and competition? Or is it going to affect the uh, mapping of acoustic phonetic representations onto lexical representations? Or is it gonna affect, a, it's gonna have a lower locus of interference? Is cognitive load going to um, corrupt acoustic phonetic encoding of the speech signal. And this is an important question because it's about the extent to which low level perception uh, in particular is or is not encapsulated from cognition, from divided attention. So a competing task that has nothing to do with speech or language. So in a sense, this question is really a test of the nature of the interface between speech perception and cognition. Right, the answer to this question, to anticipate it, and then I'll show you how we got to it, is um, yes, cognitive load affects the relative reliance 
on lexical knowledge and acoustic detail. So it's really the balance between the two sources of information that is disrupted by cognitive load. And more specifically, cognitive load enhances reliance on lexical knowledge and or attenuates reliance on acoustic detail. So the, uh, um, uh, uh, the relative reliance, so the balance between the two is affected, but it can be explained in either as either an enhancement of lexical activation or reliance on lexical knowledge or and an attenuation of reliance on acoustic detail. So let me show you how we got to this. Um, to do that, it's quite an old experiment now, but it was based on a paradigm that's even older, uh, which is called the Ganong effect. So I'll explain the Ganong effect. The Ganong effect is useful because it is, in a way, a measure of the um, tug of war between lexical activation and acoustic encoding, which is exactly what we want to see, uh, where we want to see cognitive load having an effect. So the way it works is you create a continuum between two speech sounds. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, voice onset time and um, voiced versus unvoiced stimuli, but the continuum we create in the lab here is between g and k, like in goat and coat. So it's an important contrast, of course, um, which is determined mostly by the duration of voice onset time, which is the time between opening of the lips and vibration of the vocal cords. So you can create stimuli that are clearly g and clearly k, but also a bit in between. So we created that continuum between g and k, um, and we randomized all these syllables that's how the Ganong effect works. You randomize all those syllables and you present them one at a time to participants who have to say if they heard g or k. And typically this is what you find. So on the y-axis, you have the, uh, um, the k response. If it's zero, it means they said g the whole time. If it's hundred, it means they said k the whole time. And what you find is that when it's clearly a g, they say g, clearly a k, they say and in between, well, you have a function that looks more or less categorical, and that can be debated as well. Right, but if you add s at the end of these syllables, this continuum, now you have guess to kiss. Kiss is a word, guess is not a word, but the task is the same. Did you hear g or k, ignoring everything else? And what you find consistently is that even though this doesn't add anything to the task itself, you find more k responses. So people will tend to report more responses that are lexically viable. Um, now, if you replace s with ft, we have gift, a word kift. Did you hear g or k? You get the opposite. Now, the difference between these two key conditions is called the Ganong effect. And it's typically thought to illustrate the impact of lexical knowledge on your judgment of phoneme identity. Okay, so of course that's an interesting phenomenon to measure or estimate the contribution of cognitive load. So what we did is exactly that, a Ganong effect type experiment, no cognitive load, g to k with the two main conditions here, and we found a very healthy Ganong effect which here is simply measured as the uh, surface, um, the area between the curves. You can do it much more sophisticatedly uh, with, uh, with psychometric modeling, but it's basically the same. The question is, um, what is the effect of cognitive load on this task? Right, so that's exactly what we did. In the cognitive load condition, the task was the same, g k or gif kif uh, guess, guess, randomized, did you hear g, okay? But at the same time they heard one of those syllables, um, they saw a, uh, an array of colored shapes like this one flashed in front of them for the duration of the syllable. So it's very brief, 200 milliseconds max. The task was not only to decide if they heard g, k, but also to spot the presence or absence of the red square. And here there's one. So it looks trivial, but because it's so quick, you can really feel the detrimental effect of the, uh, the visual array 
on your ability to focus on the syllable. So I'm going to give you a demo trial. I hope it's going to work. It's going to go very quickly. You'll hear a geke kind of syllable, and you'll see an array. And um, then, well, usually I ask the audience to raise their hands, but you don't have to do it here. So you have to decide if you hear gk and if there is a red square in the array. Gift. OK, so the sound was pretty soft. Um, Anyway, you usually do that over headphones and it's fairly clear what's going on. So what are the results? I showed you the no cognitive load result and here is what happens under cognitive load. So everything is more or less the same, except that the Ganong effect increases significantly under cognitive load. So it seems like cognitive load has an effect on this very simple task of deciding if you hear go or ke, and increases lexically mediated phoneme categorization. Right, so that was the starting point of this investigation. Now, what is interesting is that we also use those stimuli and run a discrimination experiment on them. So imagine the GIC continuum and we paired up um, stimuli, um, contiguous stimuli, so GIC, and we asked participants to decide if the two stimuli were the same or different. And in this representation, I'm only showing you uh, um, uh, the discrimination data on the GIF continuum, not the gift gift or kiss kiss. Right, discrimination on the no cognitive load and cognitive load. It's a very hard task, um, but it's a bit easier down the middle of the continuum that's been shown before, but you have a clear effect of um, cognitive load on discrimination. Okay. It really attenuates your ability to uh, discriminate between these syllables. If you make the task a bit easier by using syllables, um, one syllable away from each other, um, performance gets elevated a little bit overall, but you still have a massive uh, cognitive load effect on discrimination. So, what is the locus of the cognitive load induced lexical drift? Um, so the Ganong effect that we observed earlier. There are really two ways of looking at it. And I'll explore those two ways in a minute. Either cognitive load increases lexical activation. Okay, so uh, kiss or gift is being over considered under cognitive, cognitive load, or it creates a, a sort of decisional bias that favors lexically plausible or familiar percepts. But importantly, in this case, perceptual sensitivity itself would be unaffected by cognitive load. So you're still hearing or encoding those GK type stimuli the exact same way. It's just the later reconstruction of uh, your answer that might be affected by, by lexical knowledge. The alternative is, well, the opposite. The locus of cognitive load would be a bit lower cognitive load would cause a reduction in perceptual sensitivity. Um, so our ability to perceive or discriminate or to encode uh, the acoustic information itself would be uh, corrupted. And it, is, and it is because the acoustic encoding would be corrupted that it would lead to a compensatory lexical activation um, phenomenon, okay, particularly when the signal is lexically ambiguous. And that would be the, uh, the cause of the Ganong effect, the increase in Ganong effect. So in the next experiment, we, we try to distinguish these two interpretations. So what is the locus of cognitive load? Is it lexical or is it more um, in terms or at the perceptual sensitivity level? Um, an interesting paradigm that's also quite old is um, the phoneme restoration paradigm. Phoneme restoration paradigm is useful, again, because it is a way of measuring this tug of war or the interface between lexical uh, consideration, lexical activation, and acoustic processing. So is cognitive load decreasing perceptual sensitivity, or is it increasing lexical activation? We know it's doing something. Uh, it's affecting the balance between the two, but we can't really tell from the past experiment where that locus is. So I'm going to go through a, well, the restoration experiment. Here is how it works. 
we recorded long words like perfectionist. And in one condition, we added a bit of noise to one of the uh, sounds towards the end of those long words. So in this case, over the N sound. So there's a bit of white noise over the N sound. So on every given trial, you hear a degraded stimulus like that, just degraded a little bit, followed by the intact stimulus. So the stimulus without any noise. And the question, so it sounds like this. I hope you can hear. I'm going to play it again in a second. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. So the first, first stimulus is the word with the slight degradation. The second one is the one without any noise, uh, uh, any degradation. The task is to rate the similarity between the two stimuli on a scale from one to eight, trying to ignore the noise. So if you are a perfect perceiver, a, a machine, uh, you should rate this stimulus eight because the, uh, the stimulus uh, with the degradation, with the bit of noise, is actually completely intact, except that it has noise on top of it. But since the task is to ignore the noise, essentially the two stimuli, the first one and the second one, are exactly the same. Now we compare that situation with one in which the, uh, the sound has been replaced with noise. Okay, it sounds like this. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. So it's a tiny difference, but the end sound is gone. It is replaced with noise. So I'll go back to the previous one and you might perceive the difference. Although if you are not uh, wearing headphones, it's gonna be tricky. Oops. Hmm. Not quite sure how to. Perfectionist. Perfectionist. Okay. Well, you'll see in a minute what happens. Now, <clears throat> the discrimination index which is a measure of perceptual sensitivity, which is what we're interested in here, is um, calculated as the difference between the rating in the added condition, the top one, and the rating in the replaced condition. So in a way, it's a way of measuring your ability to tell the difference between presence and absence of the sound. Okay, so that's a measure of perceptual sensitivity. What's the measure of lexical activation here? Well, we use the exact same stimuli, like the two you have in front of you, but we replaced, we deleted the first two syllables. So now we have actionist in the two conditions I showed you, but everything else is the same. The noise is the same. The immediate environment around the noise is the same. And we replace the first two syllables with kind of random syllables, such that now we don't have a word, but we have a non-word. So we have hogoctionist. Um, it has all the phonotactic regularities you would expect in English words, but it doesn't map, it doesn't map onto lexical representations. So the task is the same. You have to judge the similarity between the first and the second stimuli. Hargoxionist. Hargoxionist. In the added and the replaced condition. Hargoxionist. Hargoxionist. Okay. So I don't know if you can hear the blackbird singing here, but try to ignore that. Um, so you're going to compare discrimination in the word condition and the non-word condition. Okay. Uh, discrimination being, again, the difference in rating between added and replaced. And this is what we found. So on the uh, y-axis, you have discrimination, the difference in ratings. And what we found is that um, discrimination is worse for the word context than the non-word context. So lexical knowledge reduces our capacity to discriminate between presence and absence of the key phoneme here, uh, because presumably lexical knowledge fills in the gap. So it restores the missing sound. It creates an illusion that the end sound is there. Uh, and hence, it kind of dampens your capacity to pay attention to the signal itself. Now, okay, that is known. That's what R. Samuel uh, showed a long time ago. Now, what is the effect of cognitive load on this phenomenon here? Um, will cognitive load decrease discrimination, in which case those two dots should drop? Uh, that would be evidence of a sublexical locus. Or will cognitive load magnified, uh, 
uh, uh, so, so will cognitive load magnify the size of the lexical effect? Okay, will these two points move further away from each other? And that would be a lexical effect. So we checked, we tested four types of cognitive load from pretty easy, uh, pop out, if anything is red, it's the red square to detect, or a bit more complicated, or more complicated, six by six, even more complicated, 10 by 10. And this is what we found. So <clears throat> what is absolutely clear is that discrimination um, drops as a function of cognitive load. And very interestingly, it dropped in an almost linear way. That's a bit of luck. Uh, but critically, there was no strong evidence that this decrease was more pronounced for words. So there was no evidence that the lexical effect was magnified by uh, cognitive load. So there was no effect that cognitive load, in essence, was increasing uh, reliance on the word as opposed to the non-word. But what it did is decrease discrimination across the board. So going back to the two alternatives I suggested earlier, um, if anything, at this point, it looks like cognitive load already has an effect on perceptual sensitivity. It doesn't mean that it has no effect further up in the, the architecture, but it means that the effect of cognitive load can already be uh, traced um, at the level of acoustic encoding of the information. Okay. So... Um, now, we found that cognitive load has an effect on phoneme perception, so discrimination. Um, can a reduction in perceptual sensitivity, the one we just found, be equated with a reduction in auditory acuity? So in other words, does cognitive load impair not only phoneme discrimination, but even low-level hearing? So at what is the entry level of cognitive load as a distraction in the um, speech perception system? Okay, so that's what we try to find out in the next series of experiment. So the effect of cognitive load on near threshold sound detection. So can cognitive load lead to a reduction in auditory acuity? So is it causing deafness in a way of hearing impairment? And the answer will be yes, but only in some conditions. And of course, um, that's where it becomes very interesting. Okay, but first I need to introduce or provide a reminder of a phenomenon um, that's been around for quite a long time, inattentional deafness. So in a study by McDonald and Levy, it's a beautiful study, they found that detecting a tone is harder when asked to simultaneously perform a complex rather than simple visual task. So in the experiment, it was a straightforward experiment. It was a visual experiment. Participants had to perform a visual task, which was either very simple or a bit more complicated. Very simple, you detect the orientation of a cross. A bit more complicated, you detect the orientation in the color of the cross, something like that. But simple visual task, a bit more complicated. That was the only task. However, every now and then, a, a tone, a pure tone, was played in the background near threshold, so very faintly, beep. And at the end of each block, or once in a while, they were asked, oh, by the way, did you detect a tone in the past few stimuli? And what they found was that um, participants failed to notice the tone more often if they were engaged in the difficult visual task than the simple visual task. So the conclusion was that um, the, the visual task creates a form of processing load that disrupts low-level auditory processing, uh, causing what's sometimes referred to as inattentional deafness, which is a form of uh, transient hearing loss induced by competition for amodal perceptual resources. So we thought that was a fantastic discovery, which was so relevant to what we were doing. And of course, we were intrigued by the notion of reduced auditory sensitivity under load. And um, this is what we tried to measure in the study. So quantify inattentional deafness. And what better way of, me of measuring auditory sensitivity than uh, using pure tone audiometry, which is a simple hearing 
test. So you must have had one of those maybe recently, maybe a long time ago. Uh, it's very straightforward. The question is, what's, what is the effect of cognitive load on pure tone audiometry, PTA? Now, for those who don't know what it is or need a reminder, a, uh, um, so PTA is an adaptive procedure uh, that aims to establish the lowest intensity at which you can detect a pure tone of a particular, of a particular frequency 50% of the time. So in a, in, a, in a hearing test, in a PTA test, you start with a tone of a particular frequency, let's say a thousand Hertz, that is clearly audible. If you hear it, you press a button and the tone goes down in intensity. Hear it, goes down, hear it, goes down, 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 until you fail to hear it. Then it goes up again, until you hear it goes down, up and down. And after a few reversals, you stop the track and you average the last few uh, intensity levels. And that is your 50% detection threshold. You do that for multiple frequencies of interest and for speech, it's usually between 500 Hertz and four to 8,000. And you plot all those uh, thresholds on in an audiometric chart, it's like this. And by convention, zero um, is um, normal. So normal hearing, young adult hearing levels. So zero is normal hearing. Anything below zero expressed positively in decibels is a hearing loss. Now, hearing losses are not uh, significant or meaningful uh, below uh, plus 20. So anything between zero and 15 or 20 is just fine. But the question is here, what is the effect of cognitive load on this um, audiometric profile? Is it going to drop it? And if so, by how much? Or is it not going to have any effect on the PTA track? Right. So we tested um, no more hearing English uh, speaking adults for uh, frequencies following the standard uh, British Society of Audiology guidelines, which are almost identical to the American equivalent. Um, they did the PTA task with or without cognitive load. And in the cognitive load task, uh, while they were doing the PTA task, which lasts between four and eight minutes, um, uh, visual images or drawings were flashed on a computer monitor in front of them continuously throughout the entirety of the PTA test. Subjects had to perform, to perform a two back task on those images. So those images flash one after the other every second. They had to perform a two back task, which means that with their right hand, um, they pressed a button every time they saw an image that was a repetition of an image, two images before, even if the orientation was tilted, same thing. So, and that really taps and loads the refreshing and updating subfunctions of working memory. It's really taxing. And it really is. Is that going to have an effect on the PTA uh, profile? Okay. And here are the results. So young adults, no cognitive load. As you can see, they are near the zero line. They're actually very good, particularly in uh, the one kilohertz uh, frequency range. It's not important. There is a reason for that, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so what's going to happen under cognitive load? Is it going to be on top of it or is it going to drop? And if so, by how much? It made absolutely no difference. So the two back task is really taxing. We're talking about the D prime of approximately 1.1 to 1.6. So doable, but really hard. Now, this is fantastic news for audiologists who want to see um, confirmation that a PTA test is really resilient to any distraction. So it's encapsulated from cognition. But to us, it was a surprise uh, because of the evidence everyone has accumulated on the effect of cognitive load on the entire language and speech processing edifice. So why is it stopping at uh, hearing sensitivity? Well, two explanations. One, we take the results at face value, which is always a good start. Um, but that in a way, and we conclude that cognitive load has no effect on um, uh, peripheral auditory processes, okay? That would be 
a bit strange because in a way it would undermine the very notion of it inattentional deafness. Okay, so the alternative is that it's possible that the two tasks, the PTA task and the two back task are so completely different that they actually, um, they do not compete for the same resources. And for one thing, the PTA task involves purely auditory representations of the tones, whereas the two back task involves purely visual representations of the images. So, and that might be why there is no bottleneck between the two tasks. So um, that could very well be an explanation. Um, so, and therefore in the next version of this experiment, we, um, well, we ran exactly the same experiment, but we replaced the, the visual stimuli in the two back task. And we replaced the non-nameable meaningless stimuli with uh, written non-words. Now, it's still a completely visual task, but because this task becomes a two-back rhyme task, um, we are forcing um, subvocal auditory encoding of the information in a phonological format. So this is a tricky task. Um, every time you see a non-word that rhymes, so like beam, um, well, this is a bad example because it's a word, uh, even though Sorry, this is a mistake. It should be something that, it, that could never be a word. Um, um, every time you see a non-word that rhymes with a non-word, two non-words before, you press a button. And we made sure to really force um, um, uh, uh, a phonological uh, format of encoding. We made sure that at least in some trials, the orthography was different as well. Okay. So we are really forcing an auditory format of encoding here, even though it's still visual. Is that gonna be enough to have a detrimental effect on the PTA? And it did. Very systematically, it elevated thresholds, that is, it dropped hearing sensitivity by approximately 2 dB. Now, 2 dB is not very much. If you went to your, uh, to your GP, or your audiologist, if you had a drop of 2 dB, they wouldn't even notice it. You would certainly not have to change your lifestyle. So it's not very big, but it is meaningful. So a loss of 2 dB is equivalent to, um, so if you are in front of someone in a non-COVID world, um, it's the equivalent of stepping back by approximately three or four feet. That is equivalent to a drop in intensity, so perceived intensity, so loudness of 2 dB. Okay, you can still hear them, um, but it, it is measurable. Now, the 2 dB will make a big difference if you do the same in a crowded restaurant. So if over, across a table, you suddenly swing back to stretch your back, um, you, you're gonna lose intelligibility of the person you were talking to. So 2 dB is small, but it is meaningful in everyday listening, particularly in adverse conditions such as background noise. Okay, so, um, and this is just to show you that the drop of 2 dB in the PTA is not simply added random noise in the subject's decision. It is really uh, an elevation of auditory thresholds. So as you can see, the, the, the range of the reversals is more or less the same under cognitive load and the no cognitive load. So we really need 2 dB extra of intensity in order to detect a tone under cognitive load. Right, so can cognitive load lead to reduction in auditory acuity? Um, yes, but only in some conditions. And to unpack that, divided attention leads to a small hearing loss, 2 dB, um, but only when the secondary task, the cognitive load, involves auditory representation. So that's the rhyme task. We couldn't detect a hearing loss when the secondary task involved purely visual representations. Okay, so auditory acuity engages representations that are shared with representations involved in phonological processing. And it's really those representations, not visual representations, that seem to be the, the gateway to cognitive interference. So this is where cognitive load seems to be a detrimental effect on speech or sound perception. Right, so I'm getting 
to the end. Um, we found so far that cognitive load interferes with auditory acuity, so detection of acoustic energy, uh, at least in some circumstances. And in a way, that's as low as we can go in this architecture. So what I'd like to do in the last experiment is look at the effect of cognitive load on sound duration estimation. So I'd like to go back up a little bit and talk about another way in which cognitive load can interfere with low level speech or non-speech perception. Now the case of duration is really relevant to speech here. So alongside intensity, which we discussed in the PTA study, duration is a physical dimension that makes a very important contribution to speech perception um, in terms of phonological contrast, for example. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, voice onset time is a difference in duration. Voice onset time, so the difference between b and p or g and k, um, will lead to different words and that VOT, voice onset time contrast, uh, is found in most languages as creating minimal pairs. In some languages, not all, but some languages like French um, or dialects of French at least, vowel duration um, also leads to um, different words. So also leads to, uh, to some minimal pairs. Okay, so if we can demonstrate the effect of cognitive load on sound duration, this could have pretty dramatic consequences on our ability to perceive speech and recognize words in a way. And indeed, we found that um, the just noticeable difference, that is the uh, shortest perceivable difference in duration of a synthesized vowel um, increases. So the JND increases as a function of the difficulty of a secondary task. So in this experiment, psychophysical experiment, you hear three syllables, synthetic uh, speech. Uh, you're gonna hear R, R, R. And your task is to decide which of the second or the third stimuli um, is a deviant in terms of duration, which one is longer or shorter. Okay, so um, let's see if it works. Okay, so it might be a bit soft, but here this, the third one is the deviant one, it's slightly longer. And you do an adaptive staircase experiment. Um, three interval, two alternative force choice. So that's the task I described. And basically, I'm not going to dwell on this because it's so straightforward. Um, the JND relative to a base stimulus, a base syllable of 500 milliseconds, the just noticeable difference in terms of duration under no cognitive load is approximately 60 milliseconds. So that's your resolution of duration when there is no cognitive load. As you add distraction, um, you make it almost no distraction or a bit of distraction or even more distraction, you can double the JND under heavy distraction, such as a two-back task like the one I showed you, whether the stimuli are non-words or images. So there is a clear, enormous on that scale effect of cognitive load on your ability uh, to discriminate uh, vowel durational differences. Okay, now why is duration so badly misrepresented under divided attention? Um, there are really two explanations. One of them is very intuitive and not very interesting, doesn't make it uh, untrue. And the other one is potentially more interesting theoretically. So the less interesting is that duration of uh, uh, cognitive load um, increases in precision. So it would do so by um, disrupting sensory memory, auditory sensory memory, um, because of attentional shifts between the auditory stimuli and the visual stimuli in the cognitive load, which would lead to imprecision and coarser estimates. You can kind of visualize the problem in the following way. So if this is the uh, duration you have to judge, that's your R, a syllable or your R vowel. And at the same time, you see images flashed in the background, a bit like in the PTA experiment. Because we can't 
really divide our attention equally between the two streams, the audio and the visual streams, what, hap what happens, that's a cartoon representation, is that your attention flickers from one stream to the other, which is represented here by the yellow shade. Okay, so when it comes to recalculating duration, um, there would be a gross imprecision in your ability to tabulate uh, the, the actual duration of the stimulus because your sensory memory would have been disrupted by the flickering of your attention, which means that your estimate of the duration of the syllable of the R sound could be a bit less, a bit more, leading to increased JNDs. Okay, now that's one interpretation. The other one is more interesting. Maybe what's happening here is um, what's referred to as pulse skipping. So here, auditory samples would be dropped during attentional shifts. So if you look at this cartoon representation here, um, anything that is yellow would be paid attention to. So all these yellow bits of speech, but every time your attention shifts to the visual stimulus, these samples or pulses would be skipped in your tabulation of the, of the duration of the auditory stimulus. So auditory samples would be dropped during attentional shifts, uh, which means that time estimate would be based only on the remaining samples. Okay, so you would estimate duration based on the samples you actually encoded. The other ones have been skipped, which means that your estimated duration could only be shorter. It would be wrong, but wrong in a shorter kind of way, whereas in the imprecision, a hypothesis, it can be wrong in a shorter or in a longer way. Now, the notion of time shrinkage and the divided attention is well known actually in the literature on time perception, it goes back to the notion of general timer, sort of mental clock that measures everything at the same time. And it's true that it's been shown many times that our experience of time is compressed when we are busy doing something else, okay? Well, that is the pulse skipping idea. Now, let's take a look at the evidence with respect to speech perception. Now, only one study I know of looked at this, um, this question. And it's a lovely study. It goes back a bit by Cassini and collaborators. What they did is they created a continuum between two French words, CVC, consonant, vowel, consonant, and they manipulated the duration of the vowel. Now, in French, duration uh, can lead to minimal pairs. It's a bit more complicated than that experiment, but essentially um, it's the same as if goat and goat meant something different in English. Okay, so they presented those syllables with the duration of the vowel varying a little bit uh, under no cognitive load or cognitive load. Under cognitive load, at the same time they heard a syllable, they saw um, a light flash in front of them, which was either red or green, and they had to, de to decide if it was red or green. Okay, so your attention is briefly taken away. And here are the results. So what they found was that vowels were perceived as shorter during the dual, the, the dual task or the cognitive load condition, as opposed to the ST single task condition. So there was a shift. So duration was misrepresented under cognitive load, but in the sense of shrinking the duration of the perceived word, which made it more a French word than another. Um, right. So we found this result really uh, provoking here, not only because it provides an interesting mechanistic explanation for the effect of divided attention on speed perception, but also because it leads to the counterintuitive prediction um, that uh, pulse skipping should at least in some conditions benefit perception. And I'll show you why in a second. Whereas a simple general imprecision mechanism should never lead to a perceptual benefit. So what we try to do is one, replicate the Cassini et al experiment and two, test a counterintuitive uh, yet logical implication of the pulse skipping hypothesis. So I'll try to accelerate, we're almost done. So we replicated the Cassini experiment, not with a vowel, but with a consonant, um, with the uh, continuum between g 
or que, as we did before, with the voice onset time varied with multiple steps in between. Um, baseline, you do the uh, phoneme categorization task, is it que or que uh, alone, or we did it under divided attention, and the divided attention task in this experiment was a um, simply a, where is Wally? I think it's called Waldo in the States, uh, seen flashed at the same time as the, the, the syllable. Okay, so where is Waldo, Wally here? He's here um, during the playback of the syllables. It's very quick. Results, um, here they are. No shift in threshold. If anything, the blue line here, which is the threshold, is a bit to the right of the red line, whereas it should be to the left if we believed in, well, if the pulse skipping hypothesis applied to our stimuli here. There is no evidence for a bias for G, the shorter response under divided attention. But what we did find is a flatter slope, okay, which is the less interesting phenomenon. So more response uncertainty, more randomness under divided attention. Okay. Now, and in the end, the last experiment, we tried to test a, um, uh, we pushed the pulse skipping hypothesis a bit further by testing a counterintuitive assumption here. So AX discrimination task. Imagine the continuum between G and K. We do an AX discrimination task, two syllables. Imagine if A is always the shortest one, the one with a short VOT. So G and either, well, X is either the same, it's short, so the answer is yes, same, or it's different. If it's different, it can only be longer, okay? And it's gonna be a bit longer or a lot longer. Discrimination should be very difficult in these cases and a lot easier here. Okay, so what we expect is performance going up. What happens if during the playback of X, but not A, X, we show Wally? So if it's true that um, cognitive load is shortening our perception of time and of the VOT here, in red should be the perceived version of X. And that would make discrimination even harder, okay, because red is very close, if not exactly the same as A, okay, it would get a bit better as the duration increases. But essentially, you would find a negative effect of the cognitive load task on discrimination, right? And here comes the interesting bit. If instead of a short A, you have a long A. So now A is always K, it's a long one. X is either the same, in which case it's the same. If it's different, then it's going to be very difficult in this case and a bit easier as we go down. If, so discrimination will increase. And here is the kicker, of course. If you play, if you add cognitive load to X, right, here it is, and it is true that we reduced perception duration under cognitive load, then all of a sudden, the perceived difference in duration between A and red X is actually magnified. So here cognitive load, if we believe in pulse skipping, should make the task easier, not harder, okay? And what we would expect is a benefit of cognitive load in discrimination in that particular condition, at least for the first few steps of the continuum. Is this what we found? Well, the easy condition, um, well, not the easy, but the expected one, what we found is this. So we found a detrimental effect of cognitive load in those middle syllables as expected. It's a bit of fluctuation here, but basically this is clearly a negative effect of cognitive load on discrimination. That's fine. But the other condition is the more interesting one. Did we find an improvement in discrimination? And we did it. This is exactly the same, if not worse. So cognitive load is making discrimination worse, not better even in a condition where the pulse skipping hypothesis would have predicted enhancement of discrimination. Okay, so, um, so to summarize, uh, divided attention impairs the judgment of auditory duration. That is true, but it does so by decreasing precision, not by shortening perceived duration. 
Now, it doesn't mean that pulse skipping is wrong. It means that it's unlikely to apply to the very short durations we used here for the VOT contrast. The uh, duration uh, people used in the Cassini experiment uh, were the duration was quite a bit longer. It was a French vowel, which was longer. So for short durations, like in our case, the duration of each attentional glimpse might actually exceed the duration of the auditory stimulus. So we don't know the, the frequency of the flickering between the two streams. So maybe the frequency is too slow uh, for very short durations. So that might be why. So there might, there might be more than one mechanism responsible for the effect of divided attention on low level sound perception and duration perception. So this is it, light slide, last slide. Um, I started by saying I'm interested in the effect of cognitive load as an adverse condition on speech perception, and particularly the effect of intrinsic cognitive load, such as divided attention. And we found an effect of cognitive load on phoneme perception, near threshold detection, and uh, sound duration estimation. So cognitive load clearly affects uh, pre-lexical perceptual processes, but can also have effects higher up. The PTA, so the, uh, 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 the hearing test data, suggests that auditory acuity is impoverished by cognitive load, but only when representations are shared, when they are of a um, phonological sub, sub vocal auditory nature. Um, we found, unfortunately, no evidence that cognitive load leads to pulse skipping. Instead, the underlying mechanism might simply involve a decrease in sensory encoding precision and memory maintenance. So altogether, it's part of a much bigger project. The results really invite a more cognitive approach to uh, hearing and speech perception research, which is called, uh, which is becoming well-known cognitive listening which really takes the whole system into consideration from the cochlea to linguistic processes to working memory and uh, executive control um, and attention. And I think that is it, yes. Thank you so, so much. I wanna put the, the clapping hand reaction, <laughs> which I can do. And I'm so happy that, I mean, before the questions, I'm so happy that there is a word for what I, I'm interested in, cognitive listening. That's exactly <laughs> for, for uh, uh, prosody and intonation. That's also, you know, extremely important, all the levels. Anyway, so um, I think I have to probably um, moderate the question uh, answer period. So I'm, I don't wanna, I, I would like, you know, to see, I mean, either in the chat, uh, you can put your question or, or just, you know, raise your hand um, before. Yeah, so Ryan. Uh, so we were talking with Sven earlier, and I, I think, Sven, correct me, but did you say earlier today that you found this effect of um, cognitive load on um, the, recognition, the recognition of duration, but you didn't find this effect for intensity? And pitch, or or you was you tested all three of those, I think, and you said you found it for one and not the others. That's right. Um, we found it in uh, for duration and intensity, and for pitch, it was. It's not that we didn't find it, but it was messier, and that's what made me, you know, talk about pitch perception as a potentially different dimension that is happening in a more automatic way. But no, intensity uh, followed more or less the same pattern. So with a, a clear uh, increase and in elevation of uh, um, uh, intensity threshold. So this makes me wonder because it seems that I know you, you don't say necessarily that the imprecision hypothesis is, it's not a done deal, but it seems to be pointing in that direction towards some kind of just general imprecision induced by cognitive load. But I'm curious why that would apply to duration, but maybe not pitch. Um, I guess you kind of said, maybe they do rely on different mechanisms, but I just think of duration as being so important for speech perception. Uh, it seems a bit odd. Um, I don't know. I don't know if you had any ideas about that, about those different, what the different mechanisms are. Um, I'm, I'm not surprised that divided attention affects duration and intensity. 
I am surprised that it doesn't seem to have much effect on pitch judgment. Um, I mean, you could look at it a different way. So you could say, well, pitch is calculated as early as the cochlea, um, whereas duration uh, takes a bit longer. So you need to be more or less in the brainstem. Um, but you could say, well, intensity is also calculated in the cochlea. So, um, it's, so why is an intensity behaving like pitch? Um, so for duration, you could say, uh, well, if you are playing with duration, it, you really need a solid memory trace here because you are reevaluating retrospectively the duration of the stimulation. Um, okay, um, well, but intensity, you, you don't really need as much of, well, technically of a memory trace. Um, so why is intensity um, behaving like, like duration? So th there are ways of explaining the opposite contrast. So duration works or is sensitive, the other two are not. But I find it very difficult to explain why intensity and duration are impaired by divided attention, whereas pitch is not, unless there is an evolutionary function to pitch perception, which is so important that uh, it is not distractible by anything. So, but that's really an open question. Okay, cool, thanks. Yeah. Maybe there is an evolutionary reason yeah. because pitch perception is important for other organisms for like mate selection, right? That seems to be pretty basic that lots of organisms do. I don't know. <laughs> oh, there's there's Mark uh, who has uh, is raised then, but I also have some questions that are related to pitch. If I can jump uh, uh, on you, Mark, because I want to connect, you know, what Ryan was saying, because I, then I, I thought about, you know, what we were thinking about before. Um, and I have a question in terms of, you just had a judgment in terms of pitch level, right? And not pitch um, um, direction between the stimuli. Okay, that is even more robust. We can talk about this later. Uh, and, and the other thing is that you were just, uh, how you, were you creating? This were just, there were speech, there were, it, it was pitch in speech stimuli, wasn't uh, uh, pure tones, right? That you were, no, it was a synthesized vowel. or, or resynthesized vowel. So it yeah. had a form and structure yeah. uh, that was pretty typical of an R yeah. sound. And F0 okay. was the only dimension okay. we manipulated. Yeah. And I can tell you that there's also another reason why, because when we do resynthesize stuff like this, we just change the F0. But we know now there's just very tiny uh, research on this. And this is um, something that I also wanted to do with... Uh, with one of the students who's not here, but um, apparently for tone perception, at least in um, uh, identifying Cantonese tone, uh, form and structure can also um, help. It's very, very recent work. Uh, and there's, I've also been talking to a postdoc who's at Northwestern University. Um, so we can talk about this later. I was trying to think about why would this be the case in perception? But also, I think there's like um, there's something going on with pitch. But you know, we can we can talk about this later. Also, like the the, the skipping hypothesis, I'm interested, you know, for uh, identifying contours, like you know, identifying like you know, uh, rising versus you know levels. But we can talk about this later. It's very you know technical stuff. I don't want to bother other people. Mark has, has a question. Yeah, I was. Um struck by and interested in the result you gave in the middle of your talk where um, um, your perception of something, um, uh, tones, tone detection, I guess, was, um, but it was affected by um, whether um, uh, some tasks, the, the purely visual task didn't interfere, but the, um, the phonological encoding rhyme task did interfere. Um, so that's an interesting result. And I was wondering what you thought the prospects were for playing with that result in different ways, trying different versions of it to try to get a more precise idea about um, what the modules of cognitive processing might be, what, what kinds of things interfere and what ones didn't. You sort of mentioned um, maybe uh, you, have, you made sure that it was rhyming, not visual, uh, things where the orthography might be different to sort of make sure, but it seems like you were sort of sampling from kind of the two extremes, clearly phonological versus clearly not. 
And I was wondering if there would be opportunity to play with things in the middle to get a more fine-grained things about which things uh, drew from the same resources that were Yes, we, we thought about many different things we, we, we could try. We didn't end up um, trying many of them. The only one we tried, but it doesn't really address your question, but we, um, we, we did the same experiment with all the participants. Um, and for, for reasons I can get into in a minute. And what we found was that all the participants showed an effect, so an elevation of thresholds of approximately two dB in both conditions. So for one reason or another, the distinction um, or the, the, the case I made about the, um, uh, 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 the representational format needing to be auditory only applies um, to, a, to a young auditory system. So somehow young people are protected or the auditory system is protected from a visual distraction if it doesn't engage the same representations. In all the participants, um, it, it seems to be more porous in a way and anything, any distraction will have the same effect even if it's purely visual. Um, so, but we, we, we could play with the nature of the stimuli in the two back task. We could use uh, words, we could use um, non-words that uh, rhyme but that are spelled the same way. Um, did you have something in mind or? Oh, I was just curious about that. But mm -hmm. um, um, but that seems like a, an interesting result about older. You wouldn't think that the basic cognitive architecture of the mind would change, would you? Or would it be, you know, it would be a, a, that older people are more distracted. That I certainly believe as an older person. Um, but um, um, do you know that that's a change of the effect or just that, um, you know, older people are more easily distracted? I think th that's true. I mean, it depends on how we define the structure of the mind. Um, but you could say, for example, that for a young listener, it takes processing resources to suppress the visual distraction, but they can do it because they have spare capacity to do it. Now we know that with aging, spare capacity is, is really, I mean, we, we are short of it. Therefore there is so little, um, well, spare capacity to inhibit visual distraction that we may be playing with the limit of, uh, uh, of cognitive resources, in which case, well, then any distraction will have a negative effect. So that's one explanation. A more radical one would be to say, well, the architecture of the system changes and something that was encapsulated early on becomes more penetrable by cognition. We could say that too. Um, it's probably not very parsimonious, but um, I would prefer because it's, it's an easy interpretation, the first one, which is cognitive resources. So I, thanks. So I have like a, 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 um, something that Olga put in the chat box and then there's a question coming up. I think it's Jason. I also thought about what Olga is telling you, but I, was, I, I formulated it wrongly this morning. Uh, that intensity and duration trade in perception, making a sound louder also make it longer. You know, there's, there's I don't know, maybe Olga, you want, you want to add on to this? Uh, <laughs> Like there's something like some kind of stuff that is into, you know, it's, yeah, interfering. It's, 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 it's a fine uh, we can't hear you very well, Olga. We cannot hear you very well. Okay, let's try to move closer to, does that help? Yes, yeah. Um, so it, it's a basic finding in audiology. So you have very short tones, right? Around 30 milliseconds or so, and you just make them louder. They also sound longer. So it seems like at least over like 200 milliseconds, there's an integration of how much acoustic energy there is. And, and so in that sense, intensity and duration are relatively close to each other. So don't yeah. know whether that works for you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure how it, it would explain things here, but it's true. I mean, those dimensions are not independent. And I think as, as we said earlier, um, uh, pitch and intensity are also, clearly coupled, particularly in, in, 
um, in, in phonetics and phonology. So one tends to go with the other because of mechanical constraints of how speech is produced, I guess. Um, yes, yeah, so there, there are all sorts of trade-offs. We wanted to stay away from them, Holger, because they, they are so complicated and that's why we manipulate variables one at a time. And I'm sure that if you started playing with a combination of them, you could, that would be interesting, you would find all sorts of trade-offs um, in response to cognitive load trade-offs that might be able to tell you something about the, the real relationship between those acoustic dimensions and cognition. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I think Jason has his hand. His hand yes. Even um, if I don't see you, I think it's you. Yeah, it's me. Um, so you primar primarily use kind of a dual back task as kind of your cognitive load manipulation. Have you thought about using any other types of cognitive load manipulations? So I'm thinking that vocoding, so different levels of vocoding would work really well. And also maybe even speech and noise with lower SNR uh, would be good uh, cognitive load manipulations. So that's one question, if you've looked into that. Yes, yes. Um, <clears throat> the so as I said in, in the review of, of this typology of adverse conditions, um, what you suggest are basically um, uh, changes in the signal, or, or not the signal, but um, there are adverse conditions that create an acoustic uh, disruption. Um, what we wanted to do was to move away from uh, cognitive load imposed by adverse conditions that disrupted the signal itself. Um, so, and that's why we, we chose a cognitive load that is purely cognitive. It doesn't affect the, um, the, the integrity of the signal itself. Um, in another set of experiments, we did use a uh, noise vocoded speech, sine wave speech, but that's almost a different question because it creates, well, not really energetic masking because it's not really masking, but it is um, affecting the integrity of the acoustic target. So the questions become a bit different there. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. No, that answers my question, thank you. Uh, and one, just one other question. So uh, you, you use a visual NBAC task. So have you ever thought about using an auditory NBAC task? It seems like that would be a better uh, cognitive load manipulation than using some type of visual NBAC task. Um, yes, but again, it would interfere with, with, the, with the target speech, so it would create energetic masking as well. Um, I mean, we, we could look at both, or we could look at um, a sort of dichotic listening um, you know, situation in which you, you have the two-back auditory task in one ear and whatever speech task in the other. Um, but yeah, all of those are useful. We just wanted to take things one at a time and move away. We wanted to leave the signal alone, I got essentially. You. Thank you. Um, let me see if there's the other questions. I do have a couple of questions, but I want to see if other people want to jump in. So I have another quick question. So where's the pupillometry? Is that, um, is that, is that next steps? It is the next step. Um, so Yes, so we, we have a, a whole different range of, uh, of experiments looking at pupillometry. Now, pupillometry is a bit of, I don't know if any of you, you know, do pupillometry. Um, it's a bit of a slippery fish there because it's, it's messy data, it's difficult to interpret. But um, the cognitive load um, uh, type of experiments I showed you lend themselves very well to pupillometry uh, because, um, you, you can control vision, for example, um, in a way that creates load or doesn't create load. And that is something that other people have shown. And pupillometry has been demonstrated to, to pick up um, cognitive load. So um, the equivalent of one back versus two back task will be picked up by pupil dilation. It's not a big effect, but it is measurable. Um, in a series of experiments to be run in the future, we will look at the effect of divided attention, but also the type of, um, uh, of background noise or degradation. And that's where the, uh, um, the uh, noise vocoded speech will come in almost for sure. So to add to that, so I always interpret pupil dilation as kind of this late stage measure. So I think that it would lend itself very nicely if you want to try to maybe adjudicate between these, uh, this lexical versus maybe uh, perceptual um, 
a locus in terms mm. of uh, pupillometry be more uh, sensitive to late stage things like lexical information, whereas it wouldn't be as um, taxed or as sensitive to kind of early incoming information. Um, yes. So logically, that's true. I think there is a debate, however. Uh, it's not because the, the, the peak of dilation happens quite late that it reflects a late type or stage of process. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure what side I'm on about that, um, but things are delayed and sluggish. Uh, pupillometry, some people will say, actually reflects fairly early stages of processing. It just takes a long time to see them. Um, but yes, I, I think it would certainly uh, contribute to the uh, adjudication of, of the uh, early versus late. I mean, it, it could help. If I can jump into this uh, discussion, I'm thinking, can you uh, combine uh, pupillometry with EEG and, and look at you know, stuff that happens? I mean, the other thing about pupillometry, it, 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 it's, it's a measure also of emotional stuff, which is really like immediate, right? But I'm thinking, you know, if there's a way, because you say that you, you have to see it late, but it's not, the, it's not really measuring a process that is necessarily late, but can it be combined with some more online um, kind of, you know, measuring, I'm just wondering. I mean, I don't know. It's just a question, a methodological question that I'm asking because I know that people combine different, you know, methodologies to see things in a more accurate way. But we're also thinking of using pupillometry at one point. I was talking to Jason about this for, uh, for mm -hmm. intonation stuff, but um, apparently there are some issues that I don't know about, but I, I want to learn, I want to learn about it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's been used for a prosody and syntax uh, kind of, uh, stuff you know complexity in those kinds of uh, uh, processes but anyway I, I can't imagine you couldn't use pupillometry with EEG um, I don't think they physically interfere with each other they don't I don't know they don't nope. good so that would be cool I think to do probably I don't know mm -hmm. I have to think about it <laughs> for certain yeah. processes there seem to be you know late especially with inter international stuff you know that you tend to reanalyze certain things, or, or if you're listening just to prominence, you know, pitch prominence or something like this, you know, more like, uh, yeah, but that's just uh, some some ideas. And another thing that I wanted to, uh, yeah, you were talking about the uh, de degradation of the um, sort of like um, consequential degradation of the signal that you don't necessarily want to um, submit as already degraded, let's say. So you didn't, want, you, but you know, the duration you were like, you know, modifying the duration so that you could see if the judgment, you know, in is this longer or shorter. But I'm thinking like in terms of, um, I'm thinking of something, you know, like in terms of interp interpreting um, a pitch contour, okay? But not a long one. I'm just talking about, you know, like also like a tone, like a rising or a falling tone. Uh, there's not that much. Um, um, uh, there's not that much stuff, you know, perception studies on this. But um, there's a paper by Christine Yu um, about trying to see if, you know, for Cantonese tones, if you take away certain windows, you know, throughout the, uh, you know, if you sort of like take away little pieces, if people can still reconstruct, you know, the. Uh, yeah, and this is something that, you know, one point I wanted to do before, because I, I, I believe that, you know, the dynamics uh, is really important. Like, you know, in, in the model, in the international model that we use nowadays, we just look at targets, right? L and H, but I think it's not enough. You know, I've been thinking about this for a long time. So I'm thinking like, um, can these kinds of cognitive load paradigms, can, can they say something about the phonological representation of uh, an international event? Um, it depends on the question you have. What I know is that um, I reviewed not too long ago uh, a paper that tried to replicate our finding of the uh, um, pitch duration intensity with, um, I think it was Mandarin tones, okay. asking very similar questions. Um, huh. I'm afraid I can't tell you who it is because it's, it's in the review and, and I'm not quite sure where it is at this point. But okay. what I can say is that they did find um, pretty compelling effects 
Now, they were not asking the kind of questions you have in mind, I, I, I don't think. They're not asking phonological question. Okay. Oh, I think they stayed, you know, they stopped shy of asking phonological question. It was more about, you know, an, an exploration of divided attention on um, um, Mandarin tone perception. But what, what it convinced me of was that there was plenty of scope for questions like yours. Yes. And so mm -hmm. that's what that's the kind of you know I I, I thought of and maybe I'll talk to you about this if you're interested yeah. you can mm -hmm. collaborate on this that would be fantastic, uh, and then I have just a very you know very simple probably silly question the Cassini et al study uh, which was about French um, could it be done on English stuff like you know the um, uh, lengthening that you have before a voice to stop you know like the beat versus bit uh, contrast. Um, yes, I think people would generally say that, that that lengthening, that durational contrast also comes with a change in vowel identity. Huh. Ah. But the E, oh. I mean, the E I don't, I is don't not know. a short but, version of E. Uh -huh. um, yeah, there might be a slight uh, vowel quality difference, but that's really the duration that seems to be the most important one. But maybe I'm wrong, you know. Maybe I'm not because I think there's a miscommunication. I think Maria Paula is talking about um, things like um, B E T and B E D. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm talking and, about. And you yeah, were thinking of, of of two different vowels. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yes, no, yes. maybe I, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I said that wrong. So. Yes, yes, of course. Or an accent. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, no, I, I was. Yes. Um, Thanks, yes, so. yes. You can certainly do that. It's exactly the same reasoning. It's, it's the same um, thing. Yeah, the, the, yeah. The, the only thing I would I would warn against is uh, I, I would suggest is if you're going to do something like that, try to find a contrast, a durational contrast that is longer yeah. than the one we use because it I, mean, I think the total was something like forty milliseconds. Um, so if the contrast you have in mind is not longer than that, I don't think you you'll gain any sensitivity. You, you'll just triangulate yes. the same question. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But any, anything you know duration related, even if it's a higher level, it could could be um, um, focus or you know you could play yeah yeah, with yeah of course that. yeah you know, it could be also preboundary lengthening like the yes, phrase, yes that's right phrasal stuff yes yeah yeah, yeah, yeah phrase final know, lengthening things that yeah. Olga has been looking at too you know in terms yeah. of uh, the identification of uh, uh, segmental stuff so yeah no that's no, really uh, that's really interesting yeah thanks fantastic lots of ideas. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else. We don't want to keep you much longer. It's already late for you, say 30. No, it's 7.30. No, what's, yeah, it's like- uh, It's 7.30. I think for Holger, it's 8.30. Yeah, right, 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 exactly. And I think some people had to go away anyway, so yeah. they, had, they had to leave us. But I don't know if there's any other question from the people who are around. Jason, you have another question? I see your hands. I don't know if, if it's from before. No, that was from before. That's from before, okay. Um, are we fine? Um, okay, so it was a great talk. Thanks so much, Sven. Um, I'm gonna ask, is that okay if you, can you share your slides? I mean, I'd like to have them. You don't need to give them to uh, everybody else, but I'd really I, like to have them. I was also gonna ask for the slides. Can I have uh, slides? <laughs> I mean, if you can just send it to us, we'll keep them, you know, very preciously so that we can have like a, you know, a summary. It was fantastic, you know, very yep. clear. Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll turn them into a PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Version. No, you don't I'll have to give it. To them yeah, 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 yeah. And then I'll contact you about these other things. It's really, really fascinating. Thank you so, so much. And uh, hopefully I'll see you at some point in, in a, in well, a I hope so. when yes. we start going to places again. Yeah. Do we have <laughs> well, like 30 seconds right now? Before Sven, do you have to leave right now? Can we talk? Um, no, no, I have a, definitely a few minutes. And okay. Yes. I had, I had something more oh. ten, tangential, but um, when you were talking about the phoneme restoration effect. I'm going to have to go. Bye-bye. Okay. I'll leave Bye. you. See you, Mara Paola. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thanks again. Bye. Thank, thank you so much. Bye-bye. <laughs> um, so when you, you were talking about the um, phoneme restoration effect and those, those classic studies where they find um, you were showing the difference between like word and non-word effects of phoneme restoration. And I was thinking, I'm watching this thinking, you know, the, the non-words, it's interesting how you made those where you take the, the morphology from a real word and then you add some kind of nonsense to the front of it. So there's still some kind of recognizable morphology.